let's all join on this uh, panel. And if you collect some of your questions, I will start with some. And um, there will be a mic uh, for your questions. So um, I like the notion of building things and architecture. So um, the Taj Mahal was a present for, I think, the, the princess, so to say, and it was a labor of love, or it was at least a building of love. Um, wh what are we building now? Right? I mean, I think we are at a stage where uh, we talked about it briefly, let's say, Star Trek. If you have all the future things which were conceived maybe 30 years from now that, gen uh, let's say, uh, influenced and inspired maybe the last three decades of building people. Now we have 3D printing, we have tricorders, we have all this technology, if you will. And I think whatever we can think about now is will we have a much shorter impact. We can, with Democrat, we saw that we have very easy tools, cheap tools, uh, which everybody can use. So what is the architecture? What's our blueprint for the future if we can see all this Internet of Things? So that's a loaded question, but what are we doing like, basically in the next five, ten years with this all Internet of Things and our possibilities? Um, where is this leading? What is the next building we're building for ourselves? You know, I think early on, we're experimenting. We're, we're realizing the, ca the technological capabilities to connect physical and digital. So, you know, in the environment, we have the ability to obviously translate analog into digital and, and derive meaning out of that through big data, analytic, and the like. Um, I, I think that's the first wave. The second wave is, is being more clever and systematic in how we think of architectures to, to optimize and fundamentally secure that data transmission. What's your take on it? You, you have a very, the people were missing, you said, so. Yes, <laughs> so I should elaborate on where the people are. I mean, I think it's, it's interesting you talk about the science fiction element and say, well, you know, we've already built all of that. And I think the reality is much of the internet of things, it was anticipated in science fiction, but it's still not been built out in the ways that it existed in those worlds that we saw on television and books, on film, you know, because there was a piece to all of that that was utterly seamless that requires a level of computation, analytics, algorithms, machine learning, natural speech processing that we're nowhere even close to, right? And I think, you know, one of the really interesting challenges in this space is that like many other current generations of technology, some of our expectations were benchmarked by the smoke and mirrors of the movies, right? So we have an expectation that if we talk to the wall, the wall will just do what we say, irrespective of our accent, yeah. <laughs> our command language, you know, the world is just gonna be at our behest. And I think, you know, the reality of that is that that's a, that's a much longer problem to solve. And frankly, you know, I'm not convinced that we have run out of the scientific, scientific and science fiction imaginings of these things. I mean, you know, Mark Weiser, who coined the term ubiquitous computing, this was the world he was writing about 30 years ago, and yeah. I think mm -hmm. he would say there are still pieces of it profoundly underdeveloped. Right. I mean, I think if you know, he and John Seeley Brown's kind of request of the future that it not just be connected, but it be calm. So that notion that it had an affect, that mm -hmm. it had an emotion to it, and I sort of look at what we're doing now and think that piece is also utterly absent. Right. But let's say, who is the author of now who is projecting over the next 30 uh, years? Is there somebody you know who's like, oh, this is a movie which is uh, some, which closer to the future probably, or has a... Well, I mean, I think, I think the current obsession with the movie Her is really interesting. Because <laughs> okay. I, mean, I look at, you know, I, I think of you know, science fiction in particular as being a, a place that we play out uh, socio-technical anxieties, right? It's where you so here's the things we're worried about, let's go play them out in a, sa in a sort of a safer environment. And if you look at the last 30 or 40 years of films that have been about computation, you know, start with 2001 A Space Odyssey, rapidly go through the Terminator movies, Blade Runner, Minority Report, and you end up at her. Yep. And that's really interesting, right? Because we went from machines that wanted to kill us to machines that want to break our hearts. And there's something fascinating about that arc, right, about where's the anxiety moved. And it's moved from a notion of machines having intelligence to machines having emotions. And that, for me, is an interesting shift, right? But I mean, I think some of the same science fiction writers that we looked to 10 years ago are still active now. I mean, you know, Cory Doctorow, Bruce Sterling, William Gibson, Madeleine Ashby. I think they're all kind of playing out what our prospective future might be. But much of it doesn't turn on objects anymore as much as it turns on experiences, so right. ideas about privacy, surveillance, secrecy, love. Snapchat. 
Uh, <laughs> so coming back maybe to reality. Um, <laughs> no, I like. Thank you. I would no, no, no. Sorry, I would love to spend another half an hour just talking about the movie part. Don't get me wrong. Um, people who know me know that that is exactly my topic. But I want to bring Massimo in. Um, I I thought it was interesting to say that uh, most of um, the examples. Well, first of all, it's the Internet of Cats. That was the first picture. That was maybe I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully that's not what people What's remember of this session. But um, you also talked about Africa and uh, emerging markets and how people are just much more easier now to either develop something with existing technology or use technology, but also with uh, the, the, the Arduino board. Um, and they are just kind of enabled and empowered, if you will, to participate in this huge intelligence. Uh, how um, do you feel about the difference between where, let's say, our Western world, you know, toothbrush and cat things, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what, are, what can we do and what can we re impact in, let's say, Africa or other emerging markets? Uh, yeah, I think it's interesting how there was an article that came out, I think yesterday or the day before, somebody wrote, so stop designing shiny gadgets for the, you know, for, for Africa or whatever it was the title, and it was an example of how sort of, you know, people in the U.S. try to design these products that are in their mind perfect for that particular market, and then you look at <coughs> what they are actually using, they're this, um, buying these products from China and sort of customizing them, and they cost a lot less. So in a way, to me, I'm much more interested in figuring out if we can make tools that we can, that, 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 that we can teach and then just people build their own version of whatever we're doing here. Because right. I think everything, even if we don't want to acknowledge it, I think there's a cultural element in a lot of things. We have a small office in India, and already when we have kind of conversation about the things we want to do, Clearly, there are cultural differences and things that matter more to them that doesn't, don't really matter in a different way for us. And I think one of the reasons why we opened that small office in India is because we wanted to bring that back into Arduino, so try to be less this idea that's like a Western kind of thing right. and a bit more inclusive of different ideas. But then I like, to, I like them to run away and do their own things with the technology. And so it's, we, we saw a lot of examples of people, for example, in Africa building their own Arduinos and doing their own projects. And I think that's, that's to me, it's much more exciting. Right. And um, well, let's say if we talk about empowerment, I thought one thing was also interesting, the combination of, uh, let's say, Arduino with Kickstarter, right? You have an idea, you can also now found uh, funding because obviously you are, let's say, squeezed in by some pretty big companies who have uh, initiatives and great R&D departments and you have uh, 12 people and, um, or, uh, a small team, and uh, but together with Kickstarter and let's say 10 million is obviously the the um, uh, big idea was Pebble. I think that's a striking example. Is there other examples like that uh, with a combination where technology and new cert new ideas of funding and uh, shareable economy or these things? Come yeah, in? there's also a number of people who are doing their own self starters because Kickstarter sometimes is becoming a little bit more strict on certain things. So people say, you know, what I'm who cares, I'm gonna try and do my own thing. Yeah. And so for example, on a more kind of high tech note, the people from the Fab Lab uh, Amsterdam and Vag Society, they generated this project called Fairphone and they made the first telephone, mobile phone that has no conflict minerals. Right. They went all back, all the way to Africa, to the mines to get the right minerals and go all the way. And they completely funded by saying, if you buy 10,000 of these, we can start the company. And I was tweeting every week, right. you know, and, and, in, and a lot of people did the same and I got one. And so we made something happen. And now Apple releases a press release like last week saying, oh, our phone is also X amount of percent, you know, conflict free. Right. But before this guy started this whole thing, the, the debate there was something much less, you know, in public. So I think there are these interesting examples of people using this alternative way of starting the, the, their companies and their projects that can have an impact. Like right. we started Arduino with 700 euros. Uh, 350 me, 350 David Quartier, yes, and you know, and so. So what kind of movie did you see to get inspired to uh, start Arduino? <laughs> Actually, funny enough, being a geek by training, I never really liked science fiction that much. I, but I like to read about it, so I was more into like Ray Bradbury, which is much more conceptual in a way than Asimo, which is much more kind of, you know, practical in a way. If you Right. allow me this kind of oversimplification. So in a way, I was, I'm, I'm, I was more <coughs> fascinated by design and art in a way. 
And I think it's interesting how, yes, maybe the Internet of Things is such a huge, complicated technology, but in a way, it's all about the people who have a dream for the future. You know, they dream a different world. Right. And then based on this dream they have of how the world in their mind should be, they design everything else. And that kind of brings much more interesting results. That and this is the perfect <laughs> clue for you. <laughs> you were talking about design thinking, and so art and design uh, comes into play with technology. W w elaborate a little bit on the design thinking aspect in, in your um, vision. You know, it's interesting. When you, when you think of sensing, sensing is almost global. It's, the, the difference is the, the curation, the aggregation, and the presentation of the meaning of the data that you've sensed. So, you know, Americans are so competitive. And, and you look at all of the, the um, personal health trackers to be based around competition and goals. I'm better than somebody else. Look at what I've done. Where the rest of the world doesn't necessarily think like that. So, you know, more Eastern medicine would say, I'm not competing against anybody. I'm just looking at the, the longevity of my own health. So, you know, I, I think it's brilliant to democratize the ability for people to put sensors in the world. But the real value from a design thinking perspective is what do you do with the data that's been captured and, 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 and crunched to derive meaning that actually adds value in our lives? And that's a very personal thing. Yeah. So let's say if you talk about this, I think, let's say, there's a difference between Western, or let's say European and American uh, parenthood, for example, speaking about something totally different. Uh, I spent about seven years in the US and I thought, I thought that the American uh, society is much more protected, right? In Europe, you know, oh, don't eat that sand. In America, oh God, you know, we have to rush somebody to the doctor. Sorry for, uh, but you're not, you're not American, so I'm not, there's no American here. Actually, well, you are, but you're French. <laughs> no, sorry. So, um, but so let's say, take that to another level. We have self-driving cars in 20 years. We have everything is censored and, and, and so on. Uh, there's actually a, a nice store, um, TV series, which is called uh, Black Mirror. I don't know if you oh. saw it, but that is really like, cutting edge scary part where, um, you know, if everything is like so organized around us, then I think I'm going to be like a rebel or a pirate because I'm driving my, you know, VW Carmangia and I kind of speed, uh, you know, speed pedal or something like that. Are we going to a society where everything is measured and quantified and, and so on and so forth? Is that a good thing or is it, who, is, who has a plan, right? What kind of idea do we have? For the future, are we just making it smaller, faster, um, and uh, cheaper? Because you know, Moore's law told us so. You know, it, it, does smarter mean more restrictive? Hopefully not. If the if, if smart cities are more surveillance based to to keep us, um, you know, within the lines, that would be that would be sad. Exactly. So hopefully, it opens up more opportunity and it, it gives us more insight and it enables people to interact with people better. Well, if, you know, Barcelona is maybe one of the smartest city in the world. Nobody wants to have the data of the last eight hours, what happened <laughs> when the light were out. What do you think as an anthropologist about this, you know, technology, human aspect, and, and where are we leading as a society in this? Well, it's hard to really say one society, right? I mean, you just, you know, quite reasonably nailed there are significant parenting differences on a global scale. There are different societies too, right? You know, what one might want in Spain is going to be different than in Italy subtly but different nonetheless, different than France, different than Australia. So, you know, there'll be multiple societies that play out here, right? And you already see it in the regulatory framework. So you look at what the EU is doing about personal data and privacy, it looks very different than the conversation that's happening in the US. And I think, you know, in some ways what is going to be more interesting moving forward is not that we come to one society, but that in fact we have to have these navigations and negotiations between very different understandings of those things. Yeah. I mean, you know, the EU's kind of tentative moving in this space about the ownership of personal data is very much in sort of sharp distinction to some of the conversations that happen in other places. And there are technical consequences for that. Where is the data going to sit? Is the algorithm going to move and the data will be stationary? So there's some really sort of fascinating questions for me when we start to play those things out, some of which are strictly regulatory. And then I think you will find, you know, you, you were sort of saying that the notion of Americans and competition versus other people's ideas about, you know, either harmony or communal affect, also means there are different ideas about what does surveillance really mean. I mean, there's sort of ideas of social surveillance where everyone in town knows where your kids are so they're not worried they're eating sand because there's someone looking after them, is a very different model than it has to be a parent and a child. So I, mean, I suspect what we're going to see is lots of different ways that this plays out, partly because of the fact that we have different cultures that value things differently. Now, all of that said, 
big caveat. You know, I think there are some significant moments of crisis we are approaching that have to do with the tension between what technology wants and what human beings need. And I think those are sometimes very different things. I mean, most of the technology we build, we all build, works better when it's constantly connected, plugged into a network, plugged into power, plugged into the internet. Right. As human beings, we function better when we're intermittently disconnected. It's why we have things like Lent and the Sabbath and Ramadan and Sundays. I mean, there's sort of been you know, notions of time that was different, of spaces that were different, the idea of spaces that had different things in them. So there's all of that piece, right? And I suspect there's another challenge coming with memory that's a harder one, where we talk about being able to remember, you know, the, the internet will remember everything. And the reality is, as human beings, if you can't forget things, you're going to go mad. You don't want to know what you were wearing in high school. No, you don't want to have that picture, no, definitely no. not. No. And you probably don't want to know what you said to your wife three weeks ago that really pissed her off. <laughs> and, you know, she'd like to forget it too, but if the internet's going, we can tell you exactly the contents of that fight right now, doesn't necessarily seem like that's a future that's good for human beings. So I think there's this interesting kind of moment we are sitting in as designers, as technologists, as engineers, as research social scientists, of starting to say, what is it that as humans we might want that is different from what the technology wants in the classic kind of Kevin Kelly sense, and how do we mediate that tension? Awesome. And I don't know the answer. I want to open up to questions. First row, do we have a microphone? It's running. It's running. Can we put the house lights up? Here. Thank you. Better. Hello. Uh, Joanna is my name, uh, Space Engineering. Thank you for this very interesting panel. I have a question for Jerome, but you also can join. Um, art, sorry, architecture matters. So thank you for this small piece of art of your presentation. Um, my question is, which is the most beautiful bridge you can remember? what you would recommend to see. You were speaking about buildings, but let's talk about bridges. And that's also for Genevieve. Thank you for the different cultures and arcs we were speaking, or for you. Um, so, a bridge. You know, I'm not sure I know the bridges by name, but Hong Kong is amazing for its bridges. And having lived in Boston, the I think they intimately call it the Tip Bridge. Um, is really a replica of many of the bridges you see in, in Hong Kong. But now living in San Francisco, I'd have to say there's a local bridge that's pretty beautiful itself, <laughs> one that one should not jump off of. Favorite bridge? Well, you know, parochially, I'm sure I should say the Sydney Harbour Bridge, because it's lovely. <laughs> um, the reality is there is a thing that isn't a bridge uh, near where my family has just been living for the last 10 years that is a car ferry. So the bridge is actually a cable that runs under the water and when you get to one end of the river, there is a ferry there and you drive your car onto the ferry and the car is pulled along by a cable to the other side of the river and you drive your car off again. And I like it because it is an unbridged bridge and it also is a beautiful view when you go across it. Hmm. There's another question. Do we, who has the microphone on? Yeah. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It's wonderful. Uh, Maximum, a big big fan of Arduino. <laughs> I think that's truly the uh, Internet of Things platform. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a context. I was the um, former director of uh, Oblong Industries, the company that did the Minority Report film, like originally tech. And since you talked about movies, and we know that we're moving towards um, this scenario where there's data everywhere. Now we're going to start collecting data with sensors. Cities are going to collect data around us. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned. Understanding the Hollywood paradigm of playing with people's fears um, and having an, an army of hackers building interesting things with sensors out there, who's going to take responsibility for this data? And um, I'm going to bring another science fiction uh, element. So what is really interesting about the movie, uh, the iRobot, uh, sorry, or the, um, or the book as well, the three rules of robotics, they create a certain level of uh, respect for human aspects, let's say. That's the uh, science fiction aspect. But if we take that into what's happened with the mobile industry and how data now it's you know, being abused by governments or, or by corporations, I don't know. <laughs> uh, who's going to take responsibility for that data that we can't control? You know, cities are actually watching us, sensing us, devices tracking us, other people having access to 
the minimum amount of movement that we can't control anymore because it's beyond our fears. Thank you. Hmm. Interesting. I was sort of loaded. Uh, <laughs> Only this one. I have the feeling that at some point the world is going to start to divide and there's going to be some areas of the world where people are kind of specifically not having technology and people will probably go on holiday or kind of try to move to that part of the world where they specifically have no technology. So one of the project managers that works for Arduino and she's like an amazing kind of combination of designers and technologists doing all sorts of stuff, but then she took a month off over the Christmas period, she went to Brazil to a place where they have some kind of a, I guess it's kind of a hippie city where they, there's no mobile phones, the shops open whenever they feel like, everybody know each other, but they have no technology. So she just, what, this, just went for one month to kind of, you know, release the poison from her brain. And so I think what, what he end up in situations like this where this is obviously out of control. Sounds like a cool place. Yeah, so just, just carrying on, I think surveillance aside, you know, somehow um, internet business models turn the wrong way. When, you know, it, it, if people really felt value in these social platforms, they would pay for them. So the alternative monetization mechanism is through advertising and leveraging that data to sell to somebody else as sort of a black market behind the scene. You know, I, I, it would be good to go backwards a set of years and say, as opposed to the value uh, of social platforms and everybody volunteering their personal data to be sold you know, on this black market, they should pay direct. And, and I think if we would just have a more transparent direct model to say, I have a service with you, there's value in it, freemium goes away, but I, I assure that that data will be used only for the service that, that you're using, that would be a step in the right direction. We have a last question here. Boop. Yeah. This is for Mrs. Bell. Um, my mother is 80, and for all my life I've been working with technology and media. And every time I commented something to my mother, my mother said, like, oh, this is scary. I, sh I think that the computer will wake up at night and kill me. And you mentioned before in, in, in different conversations, like, four conditions that thing has to have in order for people to freak out, like electricity in, in the past. Now we're facing the Internet of Things. That will be, what would be the, the, the most of the principal fears that you think that people will have about this new way of technology? Interesting question. So you're right, I've talked earlier in other places about what I've sometimes called moral panic. I don't know, Ben's in the audience somewhere, he and I talk about it a lot. Um, you know, for me, moral panic tends to be sort of an anxiety about technology and it tends to be triggered by a couple of very specific things. It has to be a technology that threatens to change our relationship to time. So electricity made night into day, that was d disturbing. Change our relationship to space, so collapse or elongate distances, and change our relationships to one another. And so, you know, uh, PDAs, never a big threat. Fax machines, not so troubling. Electricity, big thing. The internet, similar. Phones, the same. And all of them came with sets of anxieties, right? The introduction of early electricity was certainly accompanied in the US and the UK by all kinds of fears. Uh, in the US, the idea was if you lit up people's homes at night, women and children would be vulnerable to predators because they could see they were home. I mean, the exact converse of our notion that electricity at night brings safety, right? But there are all these kind of fears. I think, you know, the Internet of Things is so diffuse at the moment, I'm not sure what the anxiety is that will come with it. But it's certainly the case in some of the work we've done with consumers that when you start to talk to them about a world where everything is smart and connected, there are a couple of anxieties that surface immediately. Um, one of them is kind of a funny one, which is always the, well, what does it mean that my toothbrush is smart? Is it smarter than me? And you kind of like, no. <laughs> um, you know, what does it mean that my, my washing machine is smart? So there's sort of this anxiety about what does it mean to have things around me that are smart. I think more interestingly, when we've started to play out some of these future scenarios, what people start to imagine is that all of the objects around them are going to start gossiping about them. So when your fridge can talk to your internet-connected scale, which is talking to your Fitbit, which is talking to your sofa, which is talking to your television, they can all say, you know, he just sits there on the sofa all day long and don't give him ice cream. And it becomes this kind of notion of what will happen when all the devices conspire to have an opinion about me. What is fascinating is I have yet to hear a consumer say, all those devices are going to rise up and kill me. That's not it. It's they're going to have an opinion about me and it won't be good. 
And there's something really interesting about the fear of being judged, I think, and of being found out. And we've seen it in other kind of places, the fear of being assessed by the technology and found not worthy. I think there's that piece. And then there's a terribly pragmatic one that I've heard a couple of times, which is, if we're really talking about a world of smart, connected things, how big is the instruction manual? <laughs> how will I troubleshoot it? Who will I call? How do you fix it? And to your point, how can I turn it off? <laughs> and at the moment, I think the concerns are pragmatic ones. Right? And all of those are in some ways quite pragmatic. You know, where the next generation of fear comes from, the one that is, and I can tell you, we'll know it is happening. When people start worrying that the Internet of Things is bad for children, you will know moral panic is on its way. Right. <laughs> I, I think your last point, you know, beyond Pixar's next film, Appliance Story, um, <laughs> I, 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 I think it's really about simplifying configuration and setup and having simplified gateways that make everything work. That's the panic. How does this work? But, you know, by the same token, we've been telling consumers we were going to simplify their setup and have a universal television remote control for how long? Exactly. As long as we've had remote controls. And how many remote controls do most people have? More than one. So I mean, I think you know, part of the consumer reaction, and I'd argue the enterprise one here, is totally rational, is that this isn't getting any easier. But it will have cats in it. We'll have cats Thank in you it. so much. <laughs> Thank you. I'm always happy that it will have cats in it. Um, please stay for the next panel discussion.